Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers for March 23rd, 2011, the 33rd Legislative Day of the 2011 session of the Georgia General Assembly. I'm Scott Slade. Coming up on tonight's program, state leaders mark the one-year anniversary of the passage of the federal health care law by calling for it to be overturned. The House passes a bill to improve district-wide education by developing coaching programs for principals and administrators. We continue our leadership interview series tonight, and Wandy Lawson asks Senate Democratic Leader Robert Brown about his position on a campaign funding bill. And it's the end of another legislative week. We'll check in with Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report, and we'll go in-depth on health care access and affordability. I'll be joined on set by Representative Ben Watson, a physician, and Holly Lang, the Hospital Accountability Project Director with Georgia Watch. Big show coming up for you tonight. That's all straight ahead on Prime time lawmakers, but first, several national figures on hand at the Capitol today to make a case for repealing the federal health care package. And Wandy Lawson was at that press event. She joins us live for the state capitol with the details. Good evening, Wandy. Well, good evening to you too, Scott. One year after President Barack Obama signed the Affordable Care Health Care Act into law, Governor Nathan Deal renewed his call for the bill's repeal. That's a call he began while he was serving in Congress. He was joined today by Congressman Phil Gingrey and Tom Price, both physicians and by junior Congressman Rob Woodall, who said the passage of the federal health care overhaul propelled him into the race for the seventh congressional seat. In my part of the country, uh, the beautiful seventh district of Georgia, we used to talk about health care costs that were rising too fast and health care that was too difficult to access. And we used to look for exactly those kinds of patient-centered solutions that Dr. Price was just talking about. But beginning with today, one year ago, we stopped talking about trying to find those solutions and started talking about how to repeal this bill. Repeal of the federal health care reform is one area where the governor and his former colleagues see eye to eye. But while congressional Republicans also consider refusing to fund the program, Governor Deal says that approach would be detrimental to the state. I think uh, certainly all of us uh, stand united of saying that this is a piece of legislation that should not uh, be allowed to go into full play. The problem from a state perspective is the one I pointed out, is that as long as the mandates are in place, then we have to depend on the funding mechanism that the legislation also put in place, a lot of which is federal money. If the federal money is cut out and we are left with the mandates, then the states are the ones that are left in the breach. And that is what I am urging uh, Congress to pay attention to that, and I know they will. Congressman Tom Price, who is an orthopedic surgeon by training, says he and his fellow Republicans offer health care solutions that are more palatable to the general public. We look forward to moving forward positively on patient-centered uh, health reform, uh, programs that make certain that everybody has coverage, that the insurance challenges are addressed, and that the lawsuit abuse that is so rampant in our society is addressed as well. Those are the positive things that don't require putting the federal government in charge, but in fact solve the challenges that we face. It's clear that the American people do not want this bill. Uh, the, the passage of one year has continued to reveal that it remains bad medicine and that they want it repealed, and that's what we'll uh, continue to fight to do. If not, then uh, the 2012 election is uh, 18 months away. And another physician also weighing in here at the Capitol today on health care reform was the doctor of the day, Dr. Raina Muna, who says her views on health care reform cross partisan lines. With all the changes that are taking place in the economy, with insurance companies, with government, one thing remains a fundamental, which is all I want is to have my doctor patient relationship left alone. That's all any doctor ever wants. So the more you can help us do that, the better doctors we can be like we train to be. Primetime lawmakers will have more on the debate on how to make health care affordable and accessible. That's coming up in the second half of our show. Now to the legislative action of today. The House adopts two education resolutions based on the recommendations of an education study committee enacted last year. House Resolution 491 encourages the implementation of performance-based coaching programs to train principals and other administrators. Bill sponsor Valerie Clark noted that similar programs exist, but these will be now aligned with the federal race to the top standards since that program has awarded the state $400 million in education improvement grants. Administrators would use these skills to help their classroom teachers. Teachers will also be receiving training associated with Georgia's race to the top. 
and research shows that two things affect teachers' new learning. They're more likely to continue using a new practice if first, they practice in their own surroundings, and second, they practice with the benefit of coaching. The House approved H.R. 491 by a vote of 149 to 7 and sent that to the Senate. The House also agreed to crack down on teachers who receive pay increases by earning online master's degrees from non-traditional institutions or in fields that do not enhance their performance in the classroom. Teachers, in order to get that raise and get that upgrade for their certificate, they have to have a graduate degree that actually is used in their area in the classroom. And it has to be from a, a legitimate certified university and not some internet diploma mill. And of course, almost all of our teachers are doing the right thing, but with any system, there were some people who were gaming the system. And the numbers are pretty big. Uh, the, the House already the past couple years did a few bills which addressed the leadership um, areas, leadership degrees which were not being used, which was $70 million a year. Uh, we pay our teachers $800 million total a year for graduate degrees, so it's a big number. If enacted into law, H.R. 459 would apply to educators who began their graduate studies after December 15th of last year. That measure passed the House by a vote of 159 to 7 and moved to the Senate, where the only bill on the calendar today allows for more flexibility in the construction of buildings where poultry is discarded. I'll let Senator Frank Jen explain. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I understand y'all can read what is stacked in these houses. Uh, it is uh, what we might call... Uh, waste. Uh, and since these houses are not designed to be inhabited, they are very, very important to the poultry industry because they actually do protect the environment by allowing poultry farmers to apply that waste onto land at, at an opportune time. Maybe you couldn't read that fourth word. It's animal mortality composting. Yes, sir. That means we're going we're gonna to compost those no longer live animals. And when they go through that composting, they're safe to be applied to the soil. I certainly couldn't have explained it any better myself. The Senate vote of 52 to 1 means that final approval for HB 223 has gone through and that sends the measure to the governor's office. Finally, physicians and other anti-smoking advocates were at the Capitol today, urging legislators to incorporate a $1 sales tax on cigarettes into this year's budget. They say many claims that have kept the tax off the General Assembly agenda for the past three years are false. Some are concerned that Georgia smokers will go to other states to buy their cigarettes or use the internet. Well, it's an interesting theory, but what are the facts? If you look at other states across the country that have raised their tobacco tax, it's not true. So interesting theory, interesting discussion, but the facts don't bear it out. Um, I've also heard concerns of convenience store operators concerned about their drop in business. My response to them as a physician and someone engaged in public health in Georgia is candidly too bad. It's the same as my response to drug dealers in our neighborhoods and my, my response to those pushing for payday loans. It's time to ask our legislators to put forth a policy that puts the health of our state first. Tobacco has no redeeming qualities. There is nothing good that comes out of smoking cigarettes. There is no safe dose of tobacco. If tobacco was developed today, it would be illegal. It's time for our legislators to show the leadership we need. It's time for them to bump it up a buck. The bump it up a buck advocates say it is not too late for lawmakers to enact the $1 tax this year. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm in Wandy Lawson for Primetime Lawmakers. And Wandy, backing up to the governor's press conference on the impact of federal health care reforms, did Governor Deal provide specifics about the economic impact of the national plan on Georgia? Well, yes, Scott, the governor did offer some details about why he thinks the plan is bad for Georgia. He said that requiring the state health care plan to cover the children of state workers up until the time they're 26 years old, that's going to increase the cost by 12 percent. But he acknowledged that half of those premiums would be borne by state employees. And the governor also said that by serving 650,000 Medicaid recipients, that was going to cost the state two and a half billion dollars over a 10 year period. But he also said that the federal government is to cover 90% of those costs. Thanks very much, and Wandy, have a great evening. All right, you too, Scott. I'll see you on Monday when the legislature reconvenes. Have a good night.
Expressing opposition to SB 160, which would allow some public utility companies to fund political campaigns, the Senate Democratic leader recently asked the state's attorney general for a ruling about the constitutionality of current funding laws. Attorney General Sam Olins declined to provide an opinion. In tonight's leadership segment, Imondi Lawson talks to Senator Robert Brown about this matter and other issues of import to Senate Democrats. Right now, what is being asked in Georgia is to allow uh, certain public utilities to be able to uh, allow their members to form PACs, uh, political action committees, and that means that they would be able to give monies directly to candidates for office. Uh, I feel that they have enough influence now. Uh, the Public Service Commission, I believe, is overly influenced by utilities, and this would only increase that influence with legislators. Uh, so I am very much concerned about that, and I think the public should be also. So you don't consult the Attorney General about most legislation. What prompted you to reach out to Attorney General Owens on this matter? Well, quite frankly, I did not think that what was being said about the need to do this was accurate. Uh, I did not feel that the Citizens United decision really compelled us to do what the public utilities were asking us to do here in Georgia. And so I asked the Attorney General for his opinion on that, and he actually refused, which I found uh, a bit disconcerting and a little unusual, uh, inasmuch as he had given an opinion on Sunday liquor sales. And so I thought that it was interesting that he would not give an opinion on something as important as ratepayers uh, being protected, but he was more than willing to give an opinion on Sunday liquor sales. Senate Democrats have been working on the Hope Scholarship legislation that made its way through the General Assembly and of course has been signed into law by the governor. You've said that this is not the end of that fight though. Are there other measures or other means that you might have before the next legislative session or is this something that we just wait until January to revisit? In part it has to wait until the next legislative session but I think that the public uh, drumbeat to get the governor to reach into the reserves to help those students who are currently enrolled under the HOPE scholarship is still a possibility. I believe that just as the citizens of this state brought pressure on the governor as far as the pre-K program is concerned, I believe similar pressure can be brought on the governor to encourage him to allow those students who are presently receiving HOPE to be grandfathered. So we're going to continue to carry that message to the people of Georgia. Uh, to, this is gambling money that you agree to allow to come into the state for the purpose of educating our children. And I believe that when we look at the disproportionate amount of money that comes from people who are least able to pay for college education, uh, their contribution to the gambling dollars is proportionally higher than persons who uh, have high incomes. And so I think it's right that rural people and low-income people should have access to hope first. And then if there are reserves left or resources left, those persons over, with families over $140,000 should have the benefit. But first, we should take care of those who are least able to afford an education. So we have those bills over on the House side, four of them, I guess three that would actually be constitutional amendments changing the tax code here in Georgia. I would like to uh, get your feedback on those measures. Now this is one area that we can have some impact as a caucus because as you indicated, it will require a constitutional amendment. And you cannot pass a constitutional amendment without uh, the help of at least some Democrats. And so we are going to try and use that leverage to make sure that we get a fair tax structure. And we don't think that this is something, even though the uh, council has approved and made its recommendation, we do not sense that there's a lot of support for the entirety of the council's recommendations. So there will be some changes in that, and that is where the rubber will meet the road. And we want to make sure that whatever comes out of this process is fair and does not uh, place an undue burden on those who are least able to afford it. Talk specifically about what some of those those aspects of the bill might be then, or of the, of the tax overhaul. Well, for example, if you impose uh, a tax on food, I think that is a non-starter uh, from the very beginning. Uh, if you decide to not uh, address the income tax structure uh, in the sense of giving relief to persons at the top uh, of the income uh, structure and not uh, given relief to people who are working class and people who are struggling day-to-day -day middle class folks, uh, I think that is also going to be a non-starter. 
So even though we're looking at the last few days of this session, it'll be time to go into special session regarding the redistricting here in the state. Earlier in the session, Senate Democrats were coming out against the restructuring of the reapportionment office. Didn't uh, see a lot of feedback on that from the Republican leadership. However, what's the uh, position and the current status of that uh, negotiation? We ha have been very much dissatisfied with the lack of responsiveness on the part of our leadership uh, on the other side of the aisle in regards to our concerns about fairness in the upcoming redistricting process. Uh, quite frankly, the situation you mentioned earlier with the attorney, attorney general, I think that bodes a lot of ill as far as the process is concerned because if you have an attorney general who does not have enough respect for the Democratic leader to even give an opinion on something as innocuous as the uh, utilities rate pay, payers increase, uh, you can imagine that he is not going to be fair. Uh, in the redistricting process. And so in that sense, uh, we just get a culmination of, uh, of things that seem to just be piling up uh, to indicate that this process is not going to be fair. So what steps are you going to take as you head into the special session? Well, we are going to uh, obviously be very careful uh, as we chart our course on this. We're going to make sure that we uh, engage in the process as far as we are allowed or uh, as the rules permit and of course push as hard as we can to have our voices heard. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll have to assess at the end of the process how effective we've been and then each step along the way make the decision as to whether we want to go into litigation or whatever at that point. Well, we'll be following those issues as well. Senator Robert Brown is the Senate Democratic leader. We want to thank you so much for joining us here on Primetime Lawmakers. Thank you. Senator Brown represents District 26 in Macon. He served in the General Assembly since 1992. After the short break, I'll be talking with Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report for his take on goings on under the Gold Dome this week. Then we'll be discussing health care availability and affordability of Representative Ben Watson, a physician, and Holly Lang of Georgia Watch. What you need to know about health care reform as Georgians. Stay with us. Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. It's the end of another legislative week, and that means it's time to talk with Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report. I began by asking Tom about the resolution urging Congress to revise the Toxic Substances Act that came up last week on Crossover Day. That came up in the House, I think, yesterday or the day before. Uh, it didn't pass. Uh, so uncertain future right now. Not, not sure if that's going to go anywhere. The House did, though, vote to extend the Delta fuel tax exemption, and not without at least a little controversy. That came up last week on crossover day and it turned out to be a fairly close vote. Uh, Delta, as you know, has now emerged from bankruptcy and did quite well last year, posted a very good profit for the year. And the feeling with a lot of folks was, do we really need to keep giving them a $20 million a year tax break? Uh, the House vote was to pass it, but not by much. The deer baiting bill came up and, and Tom, anytime you talk about hunting regulations, you get a lot of people's Irish up. You do, and this is one of those issues that A, comes up every session, and B, is guaranteed to get the folks shooting at each other. A uh, lot of hard feelings on both sides. This year it did pass out of the House, uh, and we'll see how that goes in the Senate. Meanwhile, the Georgia Senate looked at at least looking into how much Georgia water is flowing into the Tennessee River Basin. Is that going anywhere? They passed a resolution to uh, conduct a study of uh, how the Tennessee River might be used to supply the state's future water needs. That's something that uh, a lot of the senators, especially from Northwest Georgia, uh, have been looking at for quite a while. I'm not sure Tennessee thinks it's such a good idea, 
But there's still a feeling that at some point in the future, the Tennessee River could well be a good source of water for Georgia. And as you and I speak today, Tom, today's the first anniversary of uh, implementing health care reform in, into law. Before we got here, the Georgia House passed a health care compact on crossover day. What does that do? That's a, con a concept in which Georgia would uh, band together with other states in trying to basically set up its own sort of health care insurance exchange plan, if you will. At this point, it's probably more of a fallback position, uh, which would really only come into play if health care reform was ruled unconstitutional. But it's an idea that has a lot of support here. Okay, that's recent history. Looking at this week, uh, Tom, Monday, the uh, Georgia House voted to reinstate pay bonuses for national board certified teachers, but uh, they shouldn't look for it in their check anytime soon, should they? No, no. Uh, the, the, the House passed a resolution saying we're committed to doing this if the money's available uh, to do it, but we don't know when that's going to happen. SB 10, dealing with uh, local options on Sunday alcohol package sales, the House Regulated I Industries Committee passed SB 10. What's next now? Well, that was a big hurdle for it to get over, which it did. Uh, there will be a vote probably on the floor of the House, not Monday as we originally thought, but maybe by Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, once it gets through there, it will go to the governor who has said he'll sign it. Big issues left to come, uh, Tom. Obviously the big budget, 2012, where are we there? The Senate Appropriations Committee will vote the budget out next Monday, uh, probably get a vote by the full Senate on Wednesday, and I think we're on course to get that approved pretty quickly before the end of the session. Big hot button issue, uh, immigration reform. Where do we stand there? Uh, you've had bills pass both the House and the Senate. It's a matter now of coming up with a compromise that both chambers can live with. I think we're going to see something uh, come up eventually, maybe next week. Uh, so that's still a very, very big issue over here. And finally, Tom, the uh, Tax Reform Council recommendations, where do we stand there? There's a special joint committee that was set up to basically take the Tax Reform Council's recommendation and put them into bill form. They're still working on that. Uh, I'm hearing something is going to come on, come out pretty soon, maybe next week, for the Senate and House to vote on. So uh, that's something we could be talking about very soon. Hey, thanks a lot, Tom. Appreciate you getting us caught up. Great to be here. Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report joins us at the end of most legislative weeks here on Primetime Lawmakers. Now, on to our onset discussion for tonight, health care affordability and access. The new federal health care law, the Affordable Care Act, allows for the states to create their own health insurance marketplaces as opposed to having them managed by the federal government. A piece of Governor deal back legislation to achieve that aim was making its way through the General Assembly until it was pulled last week. Opponents to the federal health care law feared passage of the bill would signal surrender in the lawsuit Georgia is currently party to that seeks to overturn the law. The state hasn't abdicated its ability to work out a non-federal solution, however. On crossover day, the House passed legislation to allow Georgia to enter into health care compacts with other states. To talk about how these health care proposals and others could affect your cost and access to care, I'm now joined by Representative Ben Watson of Savannah. Representative Watson is a physician and sponsor of updates to Georgia's Patients Right to Know Act. And by Holly Lang, Hospital Accountability Project Director with Georgia Watch, a consumer advocacy organization. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I saw a national poll this past week. 52% of, of those Americans polled by Kaiser said they don't know enough about health care reform to even make a decision. I have a funny feeling that number is, is much higher when you get right down to it. And Holly Lang, let's start with you. What do Georgians need to know now to act on health care reform? How does it affect them? Well, there's a lot of ways that it affects Georgians. Um, through coverage for those with pre-existing conditions, uh, children being able to stay on their parents' policy up to the age of 26. And, you know, what we'd like to see is more Georgians realizing what the law means for them now and to look past the party politics and see what effect it can have while it is a law and while it is something that they can benefit from. Well, these early provisions are pretty popular when you get right down to it. They uh, are. Uh, we talk about ensuring uh, adult dependence and, uh, and pre-existing uh, conditions. Just when we move down the road, we start having problems how people feel about this. Right, absolutely. And, you know, we understand the difficulty that our politicians have in where the way that they approach the law, you know, adhering to the needs of their constituents who elected them into office, while also balancing the overall need of the state and looking at this. However, you know, we encourage our elected officials to take very proactive, pro-consumer approaches to this, recognizing that as of right now, we do have a law that does need to be, you know, enacted, that the provisions do need to move forward so that they can benefit Georgians. Representative Watson, I know you write in on this. You practice medicine. You've got to help implement some of these things, and now you're in the position to be a 
policymaker. What do you think Georgians need to know about uh, health care reform? Well, I mean, I think the basic uh, aspect of this is that, you know, as a physician, I'm still seeing patients. Um, you still have your doctor-patient relationship, and, and that's, that's reassuring. You know, hopefully that will not be interfered with. You know, and, and Holly's right. It is, it is good that uh, the portability and doing away with pre-existing illnesses and the aspect of staying on your insurance, uh, your parents' insurance until they're age 26. You know, hopefully that 25-year-old has a job and has insurance. But if they don't, especially in this economy, then they can be on your insurance. But, you know, it's as these things that are implemented down the road, that's, that's the, the major issue. I mean, we're, these things are slowly being implemented, you know, and on purpose, you know, around the time related to that. And that's why the state of Georgia has joined in with 25, 26 other states in trying to overturn this. And, you know, it probably will reach the Supreme Court in, in a year and a half or two years from now. And, and we'll see if it is constitutional to require people to have insurance. And that's the real, that's the, that's the biggest rub for most people, isn't it? The, what's the so-called individual mandate that goes into effect in 2014? All right, does that violate your constitutional right? Do you have to have insurance uh, in, in the United States? Uh, you know, and the other issue too, and, and you know, I was campaigning on this, is that you, know, you have to look at the big picture also. You know, the GAO says you're, you're supposed, they'll, they will be spending a trillion dollars when this is all said and done. Mm -hmm. You know, and if the banks do what they were doing, if AIG is doing the derivatives that they were doing and the stock market crashes, and, the, and we're still spending 42 cents of every dollar in the federal system, then how can we afford to have the trillion dollars added onto that? You know, will we be like Greece? Well, you, know, you know, more on a local level though, you know, I'm here as a state representative, mm -hmm. you know, and I've got to look out after, you know, my constituents in the state of Georgia. Um, so we do have to plan for this, just as Governor Deal said. Well, one of the problems Governor Deal has with this, Holly Lang, is the, the cost of it. Right. And when you get right down to it, ensuring pre-existing conditions is the one most popular part of this. If you have one, believe me, I mean, it's really tough to get insurance for pre-existing conditions. His problem is the cost. Can we afford to ensure pre-existing conditions? Or are we getting a reality test now that we can test drive this part of health care reform and it works? Well, you know, the simple answer I have to that is can we afford to not cover pre-existing conditions? And we can, can we afford to have these folks go without the necessary health care that they need? I mean, the bottom line is that if you have a chronic condition that requires that higher level of specialty care, you're either going to escalate to where it's going to be more costly because you have to enter into the emergency room because you don't have insurance at some point, or you can treat it more affordably in a more appropriate setting because you do have insurance, or there are options that will allow you to do so. Georgia Watch was uh, in support of the health care exchange bill that was pulled last week. Does that compact that replaced it benefit consumers? Is that a good start? Well, you know, we understand why that compact was put out there. We don't think that it's an actual reality to, that will, it'll ever come about. I mean, the way that the process with it is, is that it ultimately has to be signed by the president in order to be approved. So would that actually happen? It's doubtful. So for us, you know, we'd like to see our lawmakers focusing on real solutions to the problems that currently exist and working through things like the exchange so that we can approach this in a more local way and not have it run by the federal government and other type things that, that really can have an impact on Georgia sooner than later and, and does have that potential, and I just don't know that the compact does. Uh, Representative Watson, bring us up to date on what you'd like to see happen to Georgians' access to information about their doctors. Well, that, that is part of the legislation that I uh, enacted or proposed this time. It, uh, it did pass the House, and we're working it through the Senate now. Um, I, part of the Patient Care uh, Right to Know Act of 2001, which is a series of 20 questions that, they're, that the physicians are required to answer every time they redo their license, that's once a year, mm -hmm. uh, they are updating that information. And part of that is whether or not they'll have malpractice coverage or not. So we added that question in there, and we also also uh, requiring physicians to answer that question if they're asked by their uh, patient. Um, having said that, you know, is that an issue or not? It, it has been an issue here in, here in Atlanta. You know, I want to make sure it's not an issue in Savannah, Georgia and the rest mm -hmm. of the state. We'll be watching that as that moves through. Thanks so much for bringing us up to speed on that and both your thoughts on this. It's very important and we'll have to wait on the courts for a lot of this, won't we? Absolutely.
Thanks for being with us this evening. Primetime lawmakers will not be seen tomorrow because the Georgia General Assembly is not in session. Be sure and tune in for primetime politics tomorrow at 7. We'll be discussing issues raised during this year's State of the Judiciary Address. When primetime lawmakers returns on Monday. The Senate Appropriations Committee is expected to consider the FY 2012 budget. We'll bring you coverage of that and all the latest cop capital news Monday at 7. See repeat of this broadcast tomorrow morning at 530. Coming up next on Georgia Tra Traveler, join David, Cat, and Ricky for planes, trains, and automobiles right here on GPB. This is a GPB original production.